This meeting is now being recorded. Today we have uh, T.D. McDonald from uh, one of the groups at MIT and the Laboratory for Nuclear Security and Policy. He's going to be talking to us about uh, the work he's been doing on space-based radar. So, T.D., please. All right. Uh, thanks a lot, David. And um, I just want to kind of lead off with my, my acknowledgments here. So I'm um, part of the Laboratory for Nuclear Security and Policy at MIT. Um, this is our, our group photo. Um, and I also want to uh, thank the NSC department at MIT, as well as the Carnegie Endowment for National Peace, who have variously funded me over the years. Um, and also wanted to thank um, wanted to thank uh, David and the rest of the Global Security Program for inviting me to talk. So. Uh, just a kind of a brief outline of the, the, the map of what, what we're going to cover today. Um, I'm going to very kind of briefly and superficially touch on the sort of motivation behind the project, which is there's a debate about technological change and strategic stability. Um, and going to lead that into sort of why and how that relates to radar, what's motivating us to talk about radar in particular. Um, then we'll go through the physics of sort of radar systems, how they operate, and um, also <laughs> so after we do that, then I can sort of introduce this um, sort of hide and seek model of tracking, which is just sort of trying to place bounds on sort of the space uh, of this kind of tracking problem between remote sensing technologies and uh, missiles, and Kind of narrow it down to a, to a tractable problem. And then finally, I'll, I'll touch on some of the, the countermeasures to radar at the end. So, um, as, a, as part of the motivation, I, I mentioned there's a um, sort of an ongoing debate in the political science literature about the role of technology um, and strategic stability. And I think it's well summed up by uh, this quote from one of the sort of more famous papers on the topic from uh, Kira Lieber and Dale Press. Um, that changes in technology are eroding the foundation of nuclear deterrence rooted in the computer re revolution. These advances are making nuclear forces around the world far more vulnerable than before. So really just kind of break down this argument and make it very explicit. Um, the, the gist of the argument is that there are states that rely on nuclear weapons to safeguard their ultimate security. Uh, many states use concealment to hide and protect those nuclear weapons to make them difficult to destroy in a preemptive, preemptive attack. Uh, remote sensing technologies are in competition with concealment. And so if remote sensing technologies are improving and are set to continue improving, uh, concealment will be more and more difficult to achieve. Um, and if states feel insecure about their nuclear arsenal, they may take steps to compensate that are destabilizing. Um, and Lieber and Press go on to assert that remote sensing technologies are indeed on a trajectory that will lead us towards a world that will likely be less secure. Um, and while I sort of agree with the overall setup of this argument, I think we're missing a couple of the pieces um, that we need to conclude where this argument is or where this um, trend is going to go. So what we're also we don't just want to be looking at the remote sensing technologies. We want to look at other technologies that are involved in this competition. So how technologies might aid in. Uh, so the reason why we want to talk about radar and Radar in particular, um, is that, well, first we just kind of want to narrow the scope of this problem down a little bit. So, uh, remote sensor strategic stability sort of encompasses all of the different possible ways that you could deploy, uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, we're going to focus in on one particular competition, and that is the competition between, uh, road-based mobile missiles, which are deployed on, uh, TELs, transporter erector launcher vehicles. Um, and the competition between TELs and their concealment and remote sensing technologies uh, broadly. And why we're interested in this particular competition is that transporter vector launcher vehicles, TELs, are deployed by a sort of asymmetric group of, of states. Uh, the U.S. and NATO, for example, don't uh, operate TELs at all. However, Russia and China depend on them quite significantly uh, as part of their deterrent. So if the survivability of TELs is undermined, then uh, there would be a, a large sort of asymmetry in the nuclear balance, which could be bad for stability. Um, so there are an array of technologies that are currently already deployed um, that could be used to uh, detect and track and find TELs. And we're going to assume that if a, a TEL uh, 
can be found, then it is, it is vulnerable. So the sort of main workhorse that you normally think of would be optical imaging, uh, typically from satellites. So this would be anything measuring uh, or basically creating images in the visible spectrum or near visible um, infrared, uh, those areas, hyperspectral imaging. Um, there's also uh, event or electronic intelligence. This is basically capturing um, radio signals or any communication signals between, say, the TEL and its security vehicle or the TEL and its home base and using that to either locate or identify the TEL. And then there are also um, other sensors such as unattended ground sensors or UGS, um, which are sort of static objects that you could hide, disguise as a rock and hide behind beside a road. And then if any vehicle passes along that road, um, you can transmit that, hey, a, a TEL has driven by and use a seismic monitoring to try to, to make a signature. So this is sort of the, the milieu of what's out there right now. The sort of big gap um, that exists currently is that um, if you want to detect and track TELs over an extended period of time, you need to basically be able to track them at all times. Um, the ground sensors are kind of static, so they're not really applicable to tracking. They're more of a, a queuing system. Um, electronic intelligence depends on the TEL operators being careless, essentially. And optical imaging, while useful, has limitations of working at night or through cloud cover. And just to give an example, um, the weather in Seoul I was recently just looking at, and I think on average they have about 111 rainy days per year. So about a third of the time, uh, if not more, there will be cloud cover in the area, which you're not going to be able to um, operate through in with an optical system. So which brings us to uh, why radar systems are useful is that uh, radar systems provide their own illumination, so they don't need to worry about day or night like an optical system might. And additionally, radio waves um, that the radar system uses to image are not heavily attenuated by water vapor, so they can operate through cloud cover. So radar sort of fills this big gap that currently exists in uh, tracking uh, over extended periods of time because it allows, it creates a, a capability to track objects um, in a you know, large segments of time where currently nothing can operate. So we're just going to now start jumping through how radar systems work, just so we're all in the same page, and because it's also useful to go over sort of what the actual measurables of, of a radar system are. So the basis of radar is that radar measures reflected energy. So um, our radar radar system here on the left uh, will emit a pulse of um, radio waves. Um, for our talks, we're, we're assuming this will be about 10 gigahertz, so this is X-band. Um, so it'll emit some pulse of radiation that uh, will travel to and illuminate the target. The target will scatter some amount of that radiation back, and then the receiver on the satellite uh, will measure that echo and use that to determine some things about the target. So the signal that you get back from uh, this process uh, can be described by what's called the radar equation. So this in the bottom right here is our uh, the radar equation for a single pulse, which tells you the signal-to-noise ratio based on parameters of your satellite as well as of the target. So um, in the red box here, we have the parameters that are basically controlled by the radar system operator. So this would be the power of the transmitted power, which is your PT. Uh, GT is the gain, which is a measure of the directionality of your satellite, uh, or of your antenna, sorry. And you have this one over four pi r squared uh, spherical spreading term, which accounts for basically geometry of the incident pulse traveling from the transmitter to the target. Um, in the blue box here, we have what is essentially um, under the – well, it's, it's the, the characteristics of the echo. So you have sigma, which is the radar cross-section. This is a measure of how much um, radio signal a particular object will scatter back. Um, you have another 1 over 4 pi r transmission loss term. And then you have AR, which is the area of your uh, radar antenna aperture, um, which dictates how much of uh, the reflected uh, radiation you're able to basically capture. 
And then there's this other set of terms which uh, talks about noise, and there are also a bunch of other loss factors that I've kind of just lumped together under the term L. So from the signal of the noise of your uh, return pulse, so basically the height of your echo, you can determine something about the size and the shape of the object through this term sigma. Um, additionally, the time delay from when start of your pulse to the start of the echo gives you a uh, range to the target. So the because you know how fast light travels, you can figure out based on the delay time how far away your um, signal is. So this uh, is basically the principle on how something like a um, air traffic control radar works. And it works great if you have an isolated target or isolated object that you're trying to image. Um, the issue with looking at objects on the ground is that the ground also scatters back uh, signal and it creates um, what's called clutter. So clutter is real signal, so it's not noise, but it's a real signal caused by objects that you don't care about, essentially. So radar has uh, three separate modalities that we're going to consider, um, and they all sort of either try to deal with the clutter in some way or make use of the clutter. So the three modalities that we're going to talk about will be uh, SMTI, which is Surface Moving Target Indication, um, SAR, which is Synthetic Aperture Radar, and Inverse SAR, which is just a, a variant of SAR. So we will lead off with SMTI. So uh, SMTI attempts to get around the issue of um, clutter by differentiating it in Doppler space. So basically, if your object is moving, uh, the reflected radiation is going to have a frequency shift that depends on the radial velocity of the target. So this is the projection of the velocity of the moving target onto the line of sight. Um, so this is a, a good way that you could say pick out the signal from a moving tell from all this stationary ground clutter. Um, this gets complicated somewhat by the fact that if we just jump back to slide, um, your beam has actually a, a finite width, which means that because your satellite is moving, um, sort of equivalently, you could say that your satellite is stationary and the ground is moving underneath it. Um, because your beam spans uh, a set of angles, the projected velocity onto the line of sight is going to vary as a function of angle. So your stationary ground clutter, even though it's stationary, is going to have a Doppler spread of itself. Um, so this will lead to a um, limitation of SMTI called the minimum sectoral velocity. So this relationship here with declutter is the, the Doppler shift of the clutter um, caused by the beam width. So it uh, can be approximated as twice the speed of the satellite divided by L, which is the um, dimension of your radar antenna. So the issue is that VSAT, uh, satellites in low Earth orbit, are moving around 8 kilometers per second, so it's around 8,000. L is usually on the order of about 10 meters. So you can get this, you know, hundreds of hertz shift, um, which if you're using X-band radar, uh, when you sort of reconstruct the velo apparent velocity based on the Doppler shift, um, that will give you a sort of a clutter velocity spread of about 12 meters per second, um, which is quite a lot. That's 12 meters per second is 40-ish kilometers per hour. Um, however, there are methods you can use by doing some just uh, clever signal processing to reduce the effect of this with something like uh, SCAP, which is space-time adapt adaptive processing. Um, this allows you to reduce the um, basically effective clutter velocity by a factor of about two to five. So an important parameter for uh, SMTI is this minimum detectable velocity. We're going to assume it's going to be on the order of a few meters per second, which means that for a – if you're trying to detect – a moving object, if it is moving below the minimum detectable velocity, we'll say that it's not detectable. If it's moving above, we'll say that it is. Um, so we want to now take this SMTI and, and in trying to apply it to a, a tracking problem, we need to figure out sort of how much area um, you can cover with something like this and, and how frequently you can do that. So uh, the first step is defining this sort of fairly simple uh, figure of merit of sorts, the monitoring rate. So the monitoring rate is um, the amount of area that you can monitor per unit time. So we get at this through basically the averaging out the footprint of the beam based on taking into account basically every possible direction and range that the satellite can look, and then uh, dividing that by the amount of time you need to spend 
swelling to collect an observation at each of, at each of those locations. Um, so to get the footprint, because we're working in spherical geometry, and the altitude of the satellite, if it's at, uh, say, a thousand kilometers, is of order, um, it's about the one sixth of the radius of the Earth. So we, uh, the sort of flat approximation, flat Earth approximation, tends to break down pretty significantly, especially at long ranges. So we need to do basically just a numerical integration over our, our beam footprint um, as a function of theta, which is the, uh, the internal angle of the Earth. Um, and if we do that, for basically every possible range um, at which our system can operate, we can get sort of an average footprint size. And then to get at the dwell time, we use our uh, radar range equation, or sorry, the radar equation. Um, so this is for sort of expanded to multiple pulses, or I guess it's for a coherent processing interval, um, where you use multiple pulses and build up signal over time. So what you do is you actually set a, what's called a detectability, so it's a required signal to noise for an observation to achieve some probability of detection with some probability of false alarm. Um, and if as soon as you set your your detectability, then you can rearrange this equation um, and calculate a, a dwell time required to achieve that um, for every every possible range. And we can use that to, to build up this this monitoring rate. Um, so that gives us basically a a you know area per unit time that we can we can monitor but really what we're interested in is how, if you're tracking an object moving over time you want to be making multiple observations of it separated in the time so um, what we're interested in doing is defining some area that we're going to monitor and um, sort of very conveniently <laughs> in the start one uh, arms control treaty the russians agreed to um, limit the deployment of their TELs to these sort of TEL deployment boxes um, around their TEL bases. So you can see the, the green dots would be the TEL bases in Russia, and the red boxes, the red and orange boxes, are the um, defined TEL deployment areas. These deployment areas are to be no more than 125,000 square kilometers. So that's the area we're going to use. So we have this TEL area, and then we have our uh, our monitoring rate, uh, which is actually a function of the the um, radar cross section of our target, so that allows us to build uh, a plot like this. So on the y-axis we have the area monitored. So this is the total area that you can monitor um, at some defined revisit rate, which is on the x-axis. So for example, uh, if you want to image a set, uh, an area every 10 seconds, um, if it is a 10 decibel target. Going to be somewhere in the 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5th uh, square kilometers. Um, this black line bisecting the plot is the TEL deployment area. So you can see that for a 10 decibel target, and 10 decibels is the um, minimum, it was specified by the DOD, I believe, as the minimum target size that they were designing their uh, a previous space based radar system. To be able to detect, so that's, that's the sort of nominal target size we're going to use. So if you're monitoring a tel deployment area for a 10 decibel target, a 10 decibel meter square target, um, you can do so at a frequency of once every 20 some odd seconds. So what this means is that we can use SMTI as a means to sort of monitor wide areas for moving targets. Um, that's sort of its, its prime application. TD, can I ask you a question here? What are you assuming here about the about the power? I mean, there has to be something about the uh, the satellite yes. that goes into the, these numbers, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there there is a uh, Congressional Budget Office report uh, from 2007 where they were using some notional system um, and trying to figure out what the costs were. I'll, I think I refer to it later on in the talk. Um, and so okay. I'm using that set of parameters, which um, sort of the, the highlights are it's a 10 kilowatt, um, 10 kilowatt power and 40 square meter aperture. Um, so that and it's in lower Earth orbit at I think a thousand kilometers. So every all of my plots will be using that same set of um, parameters. If you're interested in a different system, say one that's larger, or higher power, um, mm -hmm. plug those in and the plot will change. Okay, good. 
All right, so um, the second modality that I want to talk about is uh, STAR, or Synthetic Aperture Radar. Um, so STAR works, rather than trying to get rid of the ground clutter, you actually use the ground clutter to create images. So um, one of the issues with uh, basically trying to form an image with what is essentially a, a single pixel, uh, so if you have the single beam of your, your aperture, is that to resolve two objects that are closely spaced, you kind of need to get them in separate beam spots. Uh, the issue is that the beam spots for a space-based radar system are uh, kilometers across, which is not a useful resolution. Um, so what you can do is synthesize a uh, artificially large um, aperture that's going to have a very, very narrow effective beam width um, by taking advantage of the movement of your satellite. So basically, as your satellite moves along, you're collecting observations of a spot on the ground. And then you can use that phase history to reconstruct the equivalent signal that would have been measured by a much larger array. And you can use that to produce these very high resolution images. So this is, this is actually, I believe, collected from plane, um, but it's from that CBO report. Um, that shows you that you can form images of scattering objects on the ground using, using radar. Um, and again, we want to take, uh, figure out sort of how, uh, effective this would be in monitoring areas. So we can kind of go through the same process again. The only difference is that the dwell time required for SAR is dependent on uh, delta, which is the desired cross uh, cross range resolution. So finer resolutions uh, require longer dwell times. And this is intuitive because basically this bottom term is that with the VSAT is how long your synthetic array is. So the the longer you dwell, the bigger an array, the finer. Um, so if we go through the same process again um, for our TEL deployment area, um, we can see how much area we would be able to monitor using uh, STAR. And so uh, one of the big points uh, with this plot compared to the SMT I plot is that rather than talking about uh, order of seconds revisit time, we're talking order of tens of minutes. And uh, to achieve sort of image an entire tel deployment area, you need to have fairly coarse resolution. Um, so what this tells us is that STAR uh, has some use because it, uh, while well, SMTI uh, images moving objects, STAR can be used to detect uh, stationary objects, um, but it has, it is much more time intensive, so it's not as well suited to sort of wide area monitoring. Um, an additional caveat is that STAR has a limited field of regard. So this is a, picture a top-down view of, of the field of regard of a, star with, uh, of a satellite with the satellite in the middle. The field of regard is basically every location where a, a satellite could look. Um, for SMTI, it is a it's circular. Basically, it doesn't really depend on um, angle, um, except there is a, a what's called the nadir hole. So satellites essentially, or radar satellites essentially can't look down because they, there's too much radiation gets reflected off the Earth and it washes out their sensors. Um, Synthetic aperture radar, because you're tracing out this synthetic aperture that's very long, you uh, need to be looking perpendicular, basically, to your uh, direction of motion. So SAR has this sort of bow tie shaped field of regard. Um, just want to point that out, but uh, it, most of how we'll construct the rest of the, the problem doesn't really need to worry about that. Um, and then finally, inverse SAR. Um, it's a variation on SAR. So with traditional SAR, you have a moving uh, aperture, and you're using this to take uh, make observations of a stationary object over multiple angles. Um, with inverse SAR, you are using a stationary uh, aperture, and you are taking advantage of the relative change in angle um, caused by motion of some target. Um, the sort of important point for this is that the cross-range resolution delta of um, inverse star depends on um, the speed of light, your frequency that you're using to observe, the amount of time that you're spending observing, and uh, omega, which is basically the angular rotation rate. Um, because your satellite is always moving, there will always be some uh, angular rotation rate, but it is not even, I think, at its maximum, so at the point of closest approach, uh, it works out that you can only get a cross-range resolution of about two meters, which is not very good. But if your 
target happens to be, say, executing a turn. If you have a tele going around a corner or a bend in a road, um, it may be sufficiently high that you can get um, good cross-range resolution and you're essentially constructing a star image of a moving target. So this is kind of a niche application, but it's actually quite important because it provides an opportunity for uh, radar systems to be able to um, identify moving targets, which, as we'll come to in a second, um, is sort of a, an important um, parameter or important requirement. Um, so one last sort of point, this is not necessarily radar specific, but this is uh, about satellites in general, is the um, number of satellites that you need in order to be able to uh, achieve some level of coverage. So this is a, uh, a plot of the coverage of the Iridium uh, constellation of satellites. So the green dots would be the um, location of the satellite, and the yellow and red and orange circles are their fields of regard. And you need to overlap these in order to have um, full coverage, essentially. Um, and we'll come to in a little later why it's important to, to have sort of high-level coverage. Um, the number of satellites you need is a function of the angle out to which you can view. So, uh, unfortunately, this is somewhat counterintuitively, um, the left side of this x-axis uh, grazing angle actually is the furthest out. So, this is the biggest field of regard. And as you travel right along the x-axis, um, your field of regard shrinks. So, the amount of area a single satellite, cover, single satellite covers shrinks, which... Uh, corresponds to an increasing number of required satellites. Um, so importantly from Libra and Press's work, uh, they showed using just GIS mapping of North Korea, um, the road system there, that terrain effects will block line of sight to about 50% of the roads um, on this left side of our, our plot. And at 20, um, site block from just from hills and mountains was about 80, or sorry, you could see 85% of the roads. So, um, basically, the more mountainous the terrain you're looking at operating in, the further to the right on the spot you need to go, which means the more satellites you need. And this is a, assuming a, a, a walker constellation um, for those interested. Um, and this ends up kind of leading to uh, the cost, the overall cost of the constellation. So this is sort of uh, back calculated from the CPO report and then adjusted for inflation and also taking into account things like uh, the decreased cost of launch services um, that we've seen since that report came out. Um, but for each radar satellite to build, launch, maintain it, replace it once in its lifetime, and operate it over for a 20-year period, um, their projected cost was on the order of three to four billion dollars per satellite, plus another 13 to 22 billion dollars in upfront R&D costs. So. If you need a constellation of 80 satellites, you're getting into you know, hundreds of billions of dollars. So uh, this brings us to sort of the uh, model for tracking um, that I want to use. So this is basically a set of assumptions and rules that I'm using to sort of constrain the problem and try to find areas where we can take our models of how a radar system can operate and apply it to this issue of can someone operating space-based radar systems meaningfully degrade the concealment and therefore survivability of some fleet of tells. So um, as a general outline, it's broken up where you have a seeker who is op operating some console or some uh, system of remote sensing uh, modalities, including a radar component, and then a hider who has some fleet of tells. And the goal of the seeker is to find all of the tells, because if you're thinking about conducting a counterforce attack, you don't want to miss them. Um, from the hider's point of view, their goal is not necessarily to keep every single one of their tells hidden at all times. They just need to keep enough such that the seeker would not be confident uh, in launching a counterforce attack. So um, because of the way it's set up, the, the sort of onus is on the seeker to be perfect, whereas the hider has, has a little more leeway. So um, I'm just going to walk through <laughs> the set of assumptions. Sorry, it's it's a little bit of a wall of text, but i um, just going to walk through my assumptions of sort of how tells move, what information is available to each the hider and the seeker, and then sort of what tracking will look like and sort of justify each of them. And then that gives us sort of the constraints um, of the problem that we can use to sort of apply 
these physical models to try to answer these questions. So um, assumptions about TEL movement. First is that TELs are deployed in fixed deployment areas. Um, this comes from the TEL deployment boxes from uh, SALT-1. Um, and I'll assume those to be 125,000 square kilometers each. And I'm also assuming that there is never more than one TEL deployment box within the field of regard of a given satellite at a given. <laughs> um, secondly, the sort of rules governing how TELs move. TELs can either be uh, in the open and moving. Um, they can be stationary or moving below the minimum protect velocity, or they can be in a shelter. And a shelter is just defined as any structure which is opaque to uh, radar and uh, that a tell can hide in. And this doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, a reinforced structure. It could be anything that's going to be opaque to radio waves. So um, a corrugated steel barn <laughs> would be big enough. Uh, a, 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 as we'll talk about later, sort of a fine mesh strung from trees should reflect um, its metal will reflect radio waves. And so these could produce a shelter. So the, the idea of a shelter is just that if a tell is in the shelter, it is not itself detectable. Um, also constrained that tells can only move on roads and they'll move uh, with a maximum speed of 10 meters per second, um, which is about 35 kilometers per hour, 20 some odd miles per hour. And alternatively, they can move uh, at the MDV speed, which will be two meters. So the reason why I, I broke it out into these open and moving stationary or stationary slash MDV or in a shelter is that uh, while the tell, tell is in the open and moving, it should be detectable by SMTI. While it's uh, stationary or moving below the MDV, it will not be detectable by M uh, SMTI, but it will be detectable by SAR. And if it's in a shelter, it won't be detectable by either. Um, second is uh, some assumptions about uh, information um, available to the hider relative to the speaker. So sort of inherent to radar systems is that because they emit a signal, um, and because it's an active signal, so think of like a, a sonar ping, if you've ever seen, say, Hunt for Red October, um, you're emitting a signal and then measuring the echoes. And the echoes will always be weaker than the signal incident on what you're looking for. So um, if the tells are basically listening to the, the radio space, um, they'll always be able to detect if they are being illuminated by a radar system. So um, from the information balance point of view, the hider always knows where the seekers space based radar satellites are and always and is able to detect if it's being illuminated and looked at. Um, additionally, the hider can choose when to move the tells and so we'll choose to operate them at night or under cloud cover where they don't need to worry about obstacles. Um, finally we'll or next I should say uh, we'll talk about the seeker SBR capabilities. We're going to assume that they have enough satellites to have continuous coverage, which means always having at least one satellite overhead of every target uh, with a multiplicity greater than one, so at least one or more satellites overhead at a given time. Uh, the reason why we're making this assumption is that there's a paper from Lee Bin from a couple of years ago called Cracking Chinese Strategic Nuclear Forces. Um, he does a good job of laying out a lot of uh, sort of small technical issues or technical hurdles that uh, space based radar would have to overcome. So things like the site block, um, when it, when a tell turns, it's gonna, the radial velocity can fall below the MDV even though it's still moving, um, which will cause it to basically disappear for a point in time. Um, and site block from structures abutting roads. Uh, all of these things cause, you know, would be real world problems that a radar system operator would need to deal with but they can all be solved by just adding more satellites. So we're just gonna assume that the radar system operator has the capacity to just add satellites as they like. Um, and then another kind of big point, uh, big assumption is that the seeker has a robust automated uh, system for image interpretation, detection, identification, and tracking. Um, so basically this is all of the uh, machine learning kind of things. Um, this is sort of a, a big assumption, but it's not necessarily one that is um, you know, can be ruled out. And then, so the way that I'm assuming tracking is going to happen is that your seeker is going to be using uh, SMTI to monitor the cell deployment area at a relatively high frequency that's um, looking for moving objects. Um, while objects are moving, it can perform identification using inverse SAR. Um, and if a object has stopped or is stationary temporarily, you can use SAR to identify it. Um, Identification does not necessarily need to be immediate, but the more 
different objects, in, especially if you have ambiguous objects that may or may not be tell that you need to track, the more the system is going to be burdened. Um, if a tell that is moving and being tracked by SMTI stops, the seeker is going to need to basically check up on it periodically with uh, SAR to make sure it is indeed stationary and is not moving slowly with uh, below the MDD to try to, to creep away, <laughs> essentially, and become lost. Um, and if a tell enters a shelter, the seeker can maintain tracking by monitoring the entrance to the shelter. So just because the tell is not itself detectable, you can measure where the tell is not, basically, and say, you know, I saw it go into the shelter and I have not seen it leave. So you can assume with some degree of confidence that it's still in the shelter. Um, and the last point uh, is actually a uh, fair amount of uh, other work in my thesis is trying to get a better handle on this, um, sort of how uncertain does the seeker have to be in the position of the tell for it to be lost. Um, for our purposes, we're just going to assume that it's on the order of a few kilometers. So um, one of the sort of perceptions of how tracking is going to occur is using this tandem uh, SMTI for wide area monitoring and then uh, SAR for identification and tracking slow moving objects. So one of the things we're, we need to be able to quantify is how much capacity does a SAR system or a radar system have to jump between these different modalities. Um, so I'm, I've approached this by defining this property called a, a burden. So the burden is just the product of the time it takes to, um, to complete some task and the frequency at which it is repeated. Um, so just as an example, if you're taking a SAR image, SAR images take about four seconds to collect uh, on average. So the maximum frequency at which you can collect a SAR image is one over four. Um, so the product of four and one over four is one. Um, you mean that the burden will be one, which means you're using 100% of your system resources to collect star. So the, the burden, basically, this product will give you the fraction of a satellite's bandwidth that a given repetitive task takes. So um, if we want to look at the interleaving SAR and SMTI over an area, we can choose, um, so on the left axis here in blue, uh, which is the blue line, we have the SMTI burden. So as we increase the revisit interval, so we look less frequently, the burn goes down, which frees up more system resources that we can use to collect SAR images, um, which we see on the red curve and the axis on the right. So if we're looking or monitoring an area at a frequency in the, say, 30-ish second range, um, then we can collect between 8 and 10 SAR images per minute, um, which means that we can do a pretty good job with a single satellite of both monitoring a wide area for moving objects, and we still have sufficient bandwidth to check up on the number, the you know, the stationary tells that we know happen to be around. So um, basically, what this leads us to say is that this sort of uh, conception of how a radar system might track a fleet of tells um, seems like if your hider is permissive, then the radar is up to the task, basically. It has the set of modalities that even at night and under cloud cover, um, provided they permit you have a permissive hider, um, radar could, in theory, um, remove concealment from a, uh, a fleet of tells, given some fairly uh, charitable assumptions about tell operation, or sorry, about the, the development of the radar. Um, but, of course, that's contingent on the uh, hider being uh, permissive, um, when, in fact, there are a number of countermeasures available to uh, defeat radar tracking. Um, we'll talk through uh, four of them. So first there's radar cross-section reduction, um, colloquially known as stealth. Uh, there's also decoys. There's also jammers in electronic warfare and uh, radar reflective structures. So probably the most intuitive uh, and the first thing that jumps to your mind when you're talking about hiding from radar, is using uh, stealth. So the uh, F-117 plane um, has this very angular shape because, uh, as we'll talk about in a couple slides, your if you you can basically shape an object to limit the angles from which you'll have a, a strong radar cross section. So you can kind of move where your reflections are out of the zones where a satellite might be. This lets you reduce the overall cross-section. Um, additionally, on the right, 
This is a uh, plot of the loss of signal versus frequencies for some uh, coding that is radar absorptive. This is another means that you could use to uh, decrease your radar cross-section. Um, the sort of net effect of this is that you increase the number of satellites needed to detect and track some object by reducing uh, your cross-section. So the blue line in the left axis is the sort of minimum grazing angle. So if it's high on this plot, it means that you have to be close to it. If it's low, it means you have to be far away. So as your cross-section increases, you see you can detect an object from further and further away. Um, and this is the this is, yeah. Uh, but if you follow the red line, the red line in the right axis shows you the required number of satellites um, that would be needed to detect targets of a given size. And so you can basically, uh, as you decrease your cross section, the number of satellites goes up quite precipitously. Um, so 10 to the 1 is the area where, <coughs> sorry, where assuming tells operate. <coughs> in practice, there are um, sort of baseline a fair bit above that, but with some relatively simple shaping, you might be able to get it into that range. Um, if you can get down to one square meter or zero square meters, um, you get into the location, the point where the radar cross section of the tail is going to start looking like a passenger vehicle or a military jeep or something like that. At that point, um, you actually, it's not just that you're increasing the number of satellites needed, you get to the point where you're increasing the background of other objects that would need to be tracked, probably to a point where um, it would no longer be feasible to, to do tracking. Um, so radar cross-section reduction um, has some, there are possible, you know, avenues you can use to both increase the costs or completely defeat tracking, um, but it is a somewhat sort of high-tech um, countermeasure. Uh, there are some other sort of more accessible ones. So um, <laughs> this is a, a website, um, finish out of a website that for a company that sells uh, inflatable military decoys. Um, so these are obviously kind of built to um, be decoys against optical systems. Um, but you could actually, if you incorporated some uh, metal mesh into the, the skin, you can make the give them a, a radar a radar decoy uh, capability as well. Um, however, there are these are sort of large um, stationary objects. And if you're just adding uh, more decoys, you're basically just giving the uh, seeker more targets to keep track of. Um, and as we noted before, we're pretty within range of what's possible to uh, given the burden of the system to track a kind of large number of objects. So using decoys like this, you would need to deploy quite a lot of them um, to really overburden the system. But what you can do is if you're able to um, produce in a short period of time a lot of decoys that are able to approximate the SMTI signature of a tell and have those move, um, if you can create a lot of them at a time, you can overburden the synthetic after air system's capability to uh, identify and discriminate targets. Because so if you sit for a single uh, satellite, you can um, maximum identify, say, 10 to 12 targets per minute. So if you can um, basically force the satellite operator to have to identify a large number of targets in a short period of time, you can um, basically overburden their system and uh, produce the ability to move targets undetected. Um, <clears throat> so the way you would do this, because you need to basically just mimic the radar cross-section of a uh, of a cell, um, Oh, actually, I'm just going to skip here. Uh, so basically, what you can use are these structures called internal uh, corner reflectors. So the radar cross-section is dominated by this process called the specular flash. So it's where the incident angle um, of your radiation onto a surface is equal to the reflected angle. Um, with a corner reflector, because you get this uh, incident and scattered angle being equal on both sides, you end up reflecting incident energy directly back into the radar receiver, which is sort of a, a maximum, um, the, the maximum of the radar cross-section. So you can use a relatively small object to create a relatively large radar cross-section uh, radar signal, which you could use to approximate itself. So, um, so this is what's called the radar target enhancer. 
Uh, this is something you would buy if you have a small boat and you want to be more visible to nautical radars. Um, it's just a small uh, metallic basically set of corner reflectors. Um, the radar cross-section of a corner reflector can be approximated by this relationship here, which is um, 12 pi b, b to the fourth, b being this distance, uh, the distance from basically the center to the, the corner, and that depends on the wavelength that you're looking at. Um, so you can, with a relatively small um, corner reflector, so something half a meter in, in distance or less, you can create a radar cross-section signal that's sort of on par with uh, a tell that has had no, taken no uh, precautions to reduce this radar cross-section. So um, basically you can envision deploying a large number of these onto small vehicles, put them in shelters, um, and then all at once move a large number of them at a given time. Um, if you assume that your uh, SBR system is only capable of doing, say, 10 uh, identifications per minute, um, if you move at 10 meters per second for five minutes, that's three kilometers that you can move, uh, which is about the distance you need to get lost. Um, in that five-minute period of time, you'd expect the uh, SBR system to be able to do 50 identifications. So if you can move 60 targets, as long as some of them are decoys and that the seeker is aware that not everything is a tell, um, then there'll be some number of objects that you're able to move large distances and you'll create these ambiguities. Um, and the nice thing about these radar target enhancers is that they're basically collapsible. Um, if you just pull them up, uh, there's no, there are no longer corners. So you can kind of turn on and off this radar cross-section uh, production. And so you could say mount this on a small vehicle, uh, move it between shelters, close it down, and then leave the shelter as something with a much smaller cross. Um, additionally, we're going to talk about jammers. So let's move quickly through these because we're running low on time. So uh, jammers can create uh, blind spots. So the signal noise ratio of our um, measured reflected signal uh, is given by this, this top equation. The jammer to noise ratio is effectively the same, except for rather than this first term, what we have uh, this first term in the cross section, we have the power of the jammer and the gain of the jammer. And then importantly, we only have a one-way uh, transmission loss. So if you divide the jammer to noise ratio by the signal to noise ratio, um, you get this sort of the jammer equation here at the bottom, which says that the jammer power in a uh, receiver compared to a signal power is going to be four pi r squared um, and then the, the ratio of the jammer. So just to do a quick order of magnitude uh, calculation, if you set the jammer to signal power to one, um, R is 10 to the 6, because it's about 1,000 kilometers. Um, if your power is 10 kilowatts and your gain is 50 decibels, which um, is sort of what we're assuming, and your target cross-section is 10 square meters, um, if you set this gain to 1, which is basically saying your jammer is isotropic, the required power to equal the signal power in the receiver uh, for the jammer is about 1 milliwatt. So for every one milliwatt of jammer power emitted isotropically, you're equaling the signal power that the SBR signal is actually measuring. Um, so this works only in the case of the main lobe. So this is the radar pattern from a uh, antenna. And so you'll see it has the structure of lobes and nodes. Um, the lobe is, this main lobe here is on the left-hand side is basically the, the beam that you're using to image things. And then off the side, there's these side lobes, and they have these kind of nodes in between them. Um, typically jamming, what you think of is you can transmit power from an off angle into the, into the receiver. And as long as you're getting it on one of these uh, lobes, then you're putting extra noise power into the, into the receiver that you can use that have this jamming effect. But uh, what the, uh, radar operator can do is actually change the weighting of their array if they have an electronically shared array and move a node onto the angle that the jamming power is coming from and null it out essentially. Um, so you can't basically rely on, say, one big jammer emplacement say, on a hill that's going to be able to blind all of the satellites overhead. But what you can do is create these blind spots where the radar system can't look at a particular area because there's a jammer there. And you can use this as a 
as an opportunity to create um, areas where the uh, jammer just basically can't go and can't see what's happening. Um, this becomes important because you, because of the relatively modest power requirements, you can make jammers mobile. And these are actually Russian uh, jammer trucks for combating drones. Um, but if you were to say, move a truck with a jammer on it uh, between, say, shelters on a road where your tells might be hidden, move it to and from a base, um, the a person relying on a radar system wouldn't be able to see anything that's going along, going around, going on around that jammer. So it creates this sort of mobile blind spot that you can use, sort of make this shell game effect where you can move things around us and basically completely defeat track. Um, and then finally, uh, we'll talk about tunnels. So this is my proxy of the, the great underground wall of China, um, which is sort of the global name for their massive tunnel system, which they can use to protect um, the tells. The issue with having underground tunnels is that you cannot launch missiles in retaliation from underground. So if you destroy the tunnel entrances, basically tells them that I've become disabled. Um, so what we, uh, what's possible though is that you could make a tunnel that basically could protect from radio waves without putting this other requirement or this other constraint that you can't launch from inside. So um, you can use radar reflective structures to create sort of extended shelters. Um, the sort of uh, intuitive example of this would be the, the screen on a microwave. So this perforated uh, mesh that's used to prevent uh, the microwaves inside from leaking out. Um, it works on the same principle as uh, waveguides do. So a waveguide, which you would say is approximating what the hole is, has some set of dimensions. Um, it'll, if your wavelength of your radiation is too big to fit, essentially, um, then the field will be disallowed within that, and then this will act as reflective surface to that uh, incident radiation, even though it may be perforated. Um, and the size of the the openings that you're able to have is, is about half of the uh, wavelength of the incident energy you're trying to reflect. So in our case, this is about three centimeters. So a perforated holes of about one centimeter should create a relatively uh, reflective surface. And you can envision using this um, as sort of like a, basically a relatively fine chain link fence um, covering either long segments of road or just as sort of intermittent uh, shelters along the way. So um, just to sum things up, the SBR systems have sort of the capacity to detect, identify, and track tells of a permissive hider. However, there are, the hider has access to a number of countermeasures that could be decisive in defeating um, space radar. And importantly, those countermeasures are available across a number of arrays, or a, a wide range of both cost and complexity. There are some available that are very, very simple to construct. Um, and also importantly, they could be pursued in response to investments in SBR because especially some of the more low tech ones, they're not going to have a long bill. So, um, while there is some reason to be concerned that space based radar could theoretically, uh, remove concealment and lead to a decrease in strategic stability. There are sufficient avenues um, to counter it at a much lower cost that should make, that makes it relatively kind of ill-suited to the task of undermining strategic stability. Um, so just so that we have a couple moments for questions, I'll uh, wrap up there and thank you very much. Uh, okay, thanks very much, uh, very interesting. Uh, uh, I have a question to start with, and this was something you didn't um, really get into, but I wonder if, if you have uh, looked at it at all, was this question of the limitation of image interpretation, that these, uh, especially if you get a large number of satellites, are going to be spending, sending back a tremendous amount of data, and what kind of limitations that puts on uh, your ability to use that and, and what it requires in terms of looking ahead to AI and things like that in the future. Yeah, um, I've thought about it, but I, I haven't really worked it into um, this analysis because it is very difficult to sort of grapple with in a meaningful way. Um, at, so at the end of the day, you're mostly limited by how much processing power you can throw at the problem, um, ultimately, because the signal is there. It will take a lot of um, like an extremely large amount of processing power to deal with the amount of information that would come out of a monitoring system like this. Um, and that, but at the end of the day, the, the sort of end result would be something 
would be cost. It'd be an increase in cost. And the um, sort of the cost model I showed from the CDO uh, that I sort of backed out of there, uh, a pretty significant fraction, I think close to half, uh, is uh, assigned to operating the system, which is doing the, the image interpretation, the tasking in that way. So that, that's sort of built into the cost, but I haven't tried to, to grapple with that directly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I think we have time for another question. Anybody um, on, I know we have some radar experts on uh, on the call. Anybody have a question they want to follow up with? Uh, if not, I, I have one other question, which is I'm just thinking about energy requirements. I mean, you're talking about a thousand kilometer uh, orbits. Um, and you, you have this R to the fourth uh, fall off. Uh, is the assumption you can do this with uh, solar panels, or, or will you uh, need something else to get the kind of power that you need? Uh, the, the assumption is that you can do this with solar power, uh, solar panels. Um, I believe in some of the earlier um, sort of analyses of whether this was possible, uh, you would get duty factors on order of 30-ish percent uh, if you're only interested in, say, just looking at Russia, I think that's a, that's a pretty doable um, amount of, uh, say, basically a doable duty factor. And this is with relatively old solar technology. Um, so it was sufficiently, I don't want to say solved, but uh, dealt with in the past that I've just assumed that it is it is possible. And the because I'm basing this off of sort of a um, notional reasonable um, system, it only really limits your ability to say, okay, I'm, rather than talk about this notional system, I'll do one that's got 100 times the power. Um, so, you know, there's a limit on how much you could increase the power by, but for the model system I'm showing, the power power should definitely be sufficient to, um, to be gathered by solar panels. Right. So that's that's not one of the technology limitations you're running up against. And you no, were saying it, that the model... It does... Go ahead. I just, yeah, yeah, it, it's not one of the, the limitations. It does limit your ability to sort of get around some of these other issues by just arbitrarily saying you increase the increase the power, but it's not a, a limitation to deployment of these apps. Uh Okay, uh, let's see. Arg had a, a question. Um, let me see if you can. Uh... Yeah, okay, so. Um, do, what, all right. Yeah, do you have, do you want to ask your question? Yes, uh, there's a question about uh, different ways of defeating the um, satellite-based radar. So, uh, Titi, very, very interesting talk, very, very nice. Um, how does the um, well, how does the cross section of a TL uh, compare to that of a you know commercial semi truck? And can you modify its shape by putting stuff on it to make it look like a semi truck, so it looks just like the other? Hundred thousand semi trucks driving around Russia or China. Um, it, in theory, yes. So the radar cross section tends to be extremely sensitive to sort of relative um, relative distances between scattering centers. Um, my assumption has been that the uh, inverse SAR would get sufficient resolution to be able to distinguish between those two of them. Um, but there, yeah, there is a. a Definite point where you might be able to make a make a semi truck or you know a, a milk truck that has a, a big a cylindrical tank on the back um, have very similar cross section to that of a tell or or vice versa. Um, the I mean, issue I mean, is can you just like, can you just take lots of chicken wire and just sort of make build a frame and just pull a chicken wire on it with a one and a half centimeter uh, kind of cell size and there you go. Yeah. <laughs> it looks like a big rectangular kind of an object like a semi truck or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mesh wiring, or if you're trying to make something look like a tell, using a number of small corner reflectors to sort of simulate yeah. cavities. Yeah. Um, yeah, you could definitely do that. Uh, one of the issues, I just sort of assumed it was a capability and didn't really get into it because answering that question is requires defining sort of similar to your head with your work with warheads. What is a warhead? I would need to figure out what does what the, what is a tell, uh, which becomes kind of a very difficult thing to really define in such a way that you can answer it by saying, okay, you need X resolution. Yeah. But, 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 um, but, but in practice, you can make Yeah, sense. but defining what that uh, semi-track looks like, that's fairly easy, right? We can find out what its cross-sections are and just really, it looks like if you just simply have a similar shape, right? 
it appears. Yes. Yeah. Similar shape. So, so, yeah, so, so you have this mesh which is roughly the same shape as the you know the the back of a semi truck, and you would think that it would have very similar cross section. Uh, yeah, you could definitely get something close. It, it'll be missing on some of the sort of secondary uh, signatures that you look at when you're tracking tells, which would be something like a, a convoy of support vehicles nearby and things like that. Um, but oh. yeah, no, you could definitely in, increase your background um, by, by with relatively simple camouflage. Yeah. Cool. Very nice. Thank you. Uh, okay, given the time, I think we're going to have to uh, stop at this point. TD, thanks very much for doing this. Um, we will uh, have a recording this up uh, in the next day or two, uh, and if somebody would like uh, to uh, email TD with uh, with questions and you don't have his email, uh, send me an email and, and we'll get you connected to him. Thanks again, and uh, I'll let you know about the next uh, webinar. Perfect. Thanks a lot.